What's the number one piece of advice or lesson that you've learned now as an entrepreneur and a successful one? I mean, I, I think baseball is, of all the sports is probably the most analogous in that um, you go through a lot of slumps. Champions are made and cash always follows. But where did it all start? These are the true stories of the blockbuster sports deals that went down in the locker room, boardroom, and between the lines that made many people very, very wealthy. This is The Playbook. Welcome to this week's podcast and i am here with actually you know i would almost say one of my heroes even though he's younger than i better looking and smarter but he he really was because watching him play uh as one of the few true great jewish athletes you know there's that joke uh one of the shortest books on earth uh, right right great jewish athletes there's like six just the fact that i was nominated for the california sports hall of fame just shows you how desperate they are sean and i'm here with sean green uh toronto blue jay los angeles dodger diamondback he was an all-star a gold glove winner stanford scholarship baseball player this is an all-around great guy great looking very intellectual spiritual and I'm just excited to have you on the playbook because we look at not only your athletic career, but really I want to know what did you learn through that athletic career and how did it translate over into what's really been a great, successful business career. That doesn't mean you have had all successes. You know, there's very few business people that I know that haven't. You know, I think the average millionaire, Sean, most people don't know this, have been bankrupt twice wow. in their life. Uh, so that made me feel really good because I've only done it once <laughs> and I'm not looking forward because I think I have a good formula of saving money and being secure now. But, you know, let's go back just at the start of your career. You're, you're drafted in the first round, highly touted. You're playing for the Toronto Blue Jays thinking, all right, I'm brought up. I think it was 1991. They may have brought you up or somewhere in there. Is that right? I got drafted in 91. So I was called up in 93 in September. So pretty briefly. quick, pretty, pretty quick. Quickly, yeah. You're still young and you're excited. Tell me about what that's like and, and what those first few years were like. Yeah, in the beginning, I so I was called up out of double A and and you know, it didn't really belong yet, but it was a September call up as part of my contract. So I was happy to be there. And then the next year, ninety four, I, I I went to triple A and I had a great year. I got called up in June and was up for a month and really struggled. Uh, I hurt my thumb, missed a bunch of you know, a couple of weeks and and then got sent back down right before the you know, before the strike of ninety four. And, and that was, it was kind of weird. I was, the guys on my team were laughing because I was happier to go back down to my friends and be in, you know, this, <laughs> the defending world champions clubhouse with all these older guys that, you know, had kids and here I was, you know, I was 21 years old. So uh, I was happy to go back to AAA and play every day and get back to the comp you know, the familiar familiarity that I, that I had. Um, and, and then Morad, Jeff Morad from Lee Steinberg, did yeah. he negotiate at least that you still got the league minimum when you were playing in AAA? Yeah, he did a good then? job. He okay, did a good, good. job. See, yeah. So you got the best of both worlds. You got to play yeah. with all your buddies and still travel around, but you still had a little bit of money. Yeah, I mean, it was what it was not the it was it was good money, but it wasn't it wasn't right. majorly. Wasn't money. The league minimum money. league minimum then was like 109. Right. So yeah. it wasn't much, but I, I think when you I got to AAA, it was like split contracts. So you get like 50, but it was still Just still good make money. Make sure that my old firm did you did you right? You guys did me right. All right, good. And yeah, and then. Next year, I, I you know was shortened season because it took a while to get spring training going. At, you know, as the strike continued in, <laughs> into '95, and then I made the team out of spring training. And the first few years, you know, I did well. I you know hit close to 300, hit some home runs, but you know, I I just fought for playing time. Cito Gaston was my manager, and and he really wanted. He saw me as a young John Olroot who um, we had very similar swings. He had the ball, you know, a lot of line drives in the gap to left center field, and that that was my approach. Both built similarly tall and lanky and it was you know tough to to pull balls with long arms sometimes because the pitch inside you can't quite get to and and so anyway um you had guys like gene tennis who were coaches that had really short pop that's arms, right gene right? tennis who loved to pull the ball love to pull the ball and the, and the old school the mentality was different they they really um it was a big ego thing if you know if a guy could throw a fastball by those guys in the 60s and 70s then it was an insult to them so they were all about trying to get the bat you know, through the zone as fast as possible. They don't never wanted to be late on a 2-0 pitch and they'd get, so they brought that mentality into the nineties when there's a lot more, um, I think strategy and, and finesse and what I call Tony technique. Gwynn. Tony exactly. Gwynn Tony Gwynn's a perfect exactly. example. Exactly. They would have, they, I'm sure they didn't like his style at all, exactly. even though he hit 360, you know, most years. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I, I battled that for a few years and didn't get a chance to play every day. And then even my, my low point in my career was my third year, 97. I was benched for about a month and 
Um, at that point, it was, as a low point in my career, it actually turned into you know a, real, a big turning point where once I was benched and I got an argument with the hitting coach who was trying to force me to pull the ball in the batting cage, and I finally he banned me from the cage because I used to try to sneak in there without him. He caught me, <laughs> and so at that point I was on my own. So I just grabbed the batting tee and used to hit into the net. And at first it was you know very much kind of a egoish, angry type you know Wrong exercise, energy, right? Exactly like a young twenty-two year old you know, or twenty-four year old at the time frustration. And and then over time, I had started studying meditation, qigong, in the in the off season leading up to the '97 season. And I said, you know what, I'm going to try to implement some of these into this active meditation of, of hitting and off a tee and and take a breath and tie it to my the movements of my swing and concentrate on how I put the ball in the tee and and really feel my body. And and I started to get into that, and that was really where my career took off. I I finally got back in the lineup after about a month off and my first game was against the Braves. So Greg Maddox was pitching. Oh, uh, most, people, most people know him. And I hit, <laughs> I hit, I went, hit, I had three hits, including two home runs that game after not basically not playing for a month. Wow. And I just, you know, basically the rest of the season took off and, and that was a big turning point. So we're looking at, you know, the concept of the playbook and what you're describing to me is something that I find as I look back on, you know, mediocre sports career compared to great athletes like you as getting out of my own way. I always say that if I would have learned to get out of my own way in baseball and in golf, I would have been exponentially such a better player. And, you know, this idea of you, you were frustrated 24 year old and that forced you, it ended up being one of the best things in your life to start searching for, Hey, maybe I'm my worst enemy, right? We're not for in sure. blame, shame and justification. You have old school coaches. They are what they are, but, we all know no matter what you do in sports, if you can do it well, people will leave you alone. Yep. Right? Mike Trout today, mm -hmm. you're going to leave Mike Trout alone. Yep. You're going to leave Tony Gwynn alone. Not when he first got called up. Not though. when he, right. Exactly. But, but people but, forget about that. And You're right. And, yeah. and they forget about, you know, even other great athletes when they first start. But tell me about the lesson there, that, that playbook of what that meant to you you know, through meditation, through what you were learning, like how far in your own way is, because I think that's a major lesson for life and for business that most people don't understand. If, if they can understand you're your biggest enemy, how everything opens up and how simple it is. Without a doubt. I mean, for me, that was, you know, that was really a big key because I was doing well enough my first couple of years until, you know, I, I struggled and got benched, but my numbers were good enough where if, had I not had this this period, I would have just kept going with my same approach because it was good enough. And it was, I was going to, I would have had a 10 or 15 year career and probably made half or a third you, of the money that I ended up you've making. You've been what I call Eric Harris, right? Well, I mean, 30 home runs, 100 <laughs> RBI. Well, no, I was, been an all -star. I would have probably been, yeah, I mean, I would probably been 20 home runs because I, I, okay. I was just much more, you know, just fillet the ball over the shortstop's head and, and not try to do too much. And what happened, which I think is really, you were similar, a little Jew and he's a big group. <laughs> that's right. Skinny that right? Jew. Okay, exactly. <laughs> But I, I think to have some adversity and same in business, to have some adversity that resets it and, and just says, you know what, I need to make some changes. I need to, there's a better way, as you're saying, to get out of your own way is to, to break everything apart and say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rebuild. For me, it was my swing and my approach and my, my focus and mentality with the meditation is I'm gonna break everything apart and start over from scratch. And I had this month on the bench and that was the time I said, I could just sit here and pout or I could try to make changes. And, and that's what I did. And, and I think it was the best thing. It's the best thing that happened. I, don't, I think if I would have been in an organization where I would have been playing every day and had a great situation, I don't think I would have had as good a career as I did. It's interesting you say that because I always, you know, my business partner is Warren Moon and he credits the fact that they sent him to Canada. Uh, and I always credit my bankruptcy as being the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it forced me to go back and take stock in who I was and who I wanted to become, led me to meditation, led me to all these things. But Warren always says that, you know, Dave, if I was drafted in the first round, like I should have been, and I was a second string quarterback, because back then you didn't start as early as a young quarterback, but I was making millions of dollars. I'm not sure I would have thrown 10,000 passes a, a year, you know, and really had a chip on my shoulder like Tom Brady every single game, which is, I think ironic because, you know, Warren never showed the chip on his sh shoulder. You know, he wasn't verbal, just like Tom. Right. Tom earlier on, probably more than Warren. But, you know, he had to stay humble because he was an African-American quarterback. But he says because they did that to him, didn't let him in the league, that he practiced so hard in Edmonton 
that it made him this great quarterback. And I just saw they posted up, you know, the only quarterbacks ever over 40 to throw three touchdowns and 400 yards in a game is Warren Moon and Tom Brady. That wouldn't happen but for being benched or being sat for six years in Edmonton or for me going bankrupt. And I think that lesson is that we have to enjoy the pursuit of our potential. And if we can truly be above the game like you are and say, you know what, I should really look at this a different way. You've heard change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Right. And that's what you did. Was there someone, a coach, a player, a girl, a mom, a dad, was there someone that kind of coached you into that or did you just come to an enlightenment by yourself? No, I think I, I, it was really on my own. I mean, my, my parents were very supportive. My dad, like a lot of um, athletes that succeed, that the dad usually is very involved, and my dad was like that. So I would always bounce things off him. But when it came down to it, it had to be me. I mean, it was it was really revamping. You know, there's issues with my swing that always kind of bothered me. And I said, I'm just going to break it all apart, and, and I'm going to change my focus and um, and – really try to be in the moment and not think about you know what's happened or worry about what's going to happen and just really tr try to be present and it's so hard in baseball because you look up at the scoreboard and it's all about what you did right. so far you know that season and you go in the media and it's talking about you know are you going to get traded and this and that so you're thinking about the future and and so I was that mindset which I started working on with with this Qigong guy in 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 Orange County um that it was all the right timing. Everything happened at the perfect timing, which, you know, this, I, I believe the there's no coincidences. It was, <laughs> right, it was right. Too. Right way yeah. at the perfect time. Exactly. And, and, and to be able to put all that together, like, that was my job. Nice. And so now you're one of the high, you know, played 15 years in the league. You're an all-star gold glove. You have, I think, one of the biggest signing bonuses, great contract, you know, like you said. this Spoken like a true agent. Right? Yeah, I think yeah, no, no plug for Lee Steinberg and Jeff Morad, but one of the greatest contracts ever of your time. Uh, but no, truly, and you talk about no matter who you are, a Sean Green or, you know, some football, basketball, or baseball player, you now finish playing. And it's not just the money, because you supposedly have enough money to live the rest of your life, which may or may not be true. But the worst is there's a huge transition or transformation now worse than being benched you now have to change your entire career after 20 some years of only doing truly one thing and being so focused what, talk me through that playbook of what that's like yeah i mean it's the the challenge is you know everyone as a player you're focused as a professional athlete i think it's probably consistent amongst you know all the all the different sports is you want to get that you know that sfl contract that set for life contract and i had that and you think, okay, I'm just going to ride off in the sunset. You have these visions of what your post playing career, all the things that you missed out on, especially baseball all summer long, you're, it's gone. And so now I had all these things I wanted to do and, you know, spend time with my family, which I, I fortunately have been able to do a lot of. Um, but what you don't realize is that y you, you put your entire being into a career and, and a trade and, it's really hard to have nothing after that. I mean, some guys love love golfing. I enjoy golfing, but it's not something I could do. Right, every it's a slow day. death to me. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, and to be thirty five years old and you know to go out and imagine a life of just playing golf every day is it's just not that appealing to me. And don't buy a golf course either. I mean, that was the no, catalyst that, for me. That's right. Someone gave me. I talk about. I would say you should ask for help. I buy this golf course and never ask anyone what I should do. And it does very well. We, we invest about 12 million and on paper, it goes up to like 120 million, but I never asked anyone for help. And one guy told me after I lost all my money, he said, you know, somebody should have told you, you always should be the third owner of a golf course because you buy it from the guy yeah. who went bankrupt. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right. So, um, so, so, you know, you come into the world and there's some other issues that go along with what you're talking about because there's an emotional issue and an ego issue about now you're in the business world and you're making seven figures a year you think you can continue to do that and you start realizing that you know most people think that a hundred thousand dollars a year is a lot of money and it's not so easy in the business world to make a hundred and then everyone has a certain perception about you too if you're trying to make money when you're so wealthy yeah that was that was a hard thing for me and it's, it's taken years to get to the point where i feel like it's okay at first i was my attitude was I didn't want to have a business card. I didn't want to be out like selling, you know, things to people. And cause I felt like I felt weird about it. Cause I felt like everyone knew exactly how much money I made and um, they knew me as a baseball player and I knew myself as a baseball player. So to, to kind of 
transition out of that and change hats and say, okay, it took, you know, it took years to get to the point where I really felt comfortable uh, as an entrepreneur. And, um, and I think that that's a challenge, it's a challenge for guys. And the other, the other issue is, you know, I, I knew baseball really well. And that's when, why I think a lot of athletes, they get into coaching, they get into broadcasting, they open up an academy or whatever it is, they become agents. Um, cause that's the world they know. And, you know, everyone's doing things for them in the business on the business side. So, um, they have people investing their money. If they're in, into, if they're into startups, they have maybe a fund that people are, are running. So, right. um, to, to actually immerse yourself and learn is, is, it's kind of humbling because you, you're at the peak of a career that, you know, most people would, would dream of. And now you're starting from scratch again. Right. And like you said, your brand diminishes every year. Oh yeah. And, and you know, I deal with hall of famers even, and it's amazing mm -hmm. where they can go and no one knows who they are. And, and there's this conflict that, gosh, I used to go into a restaurant and everybody would bow to me and pay for everything. Right, right. And now it's like, I can barely get a table. Yeah. So there's this emotional problem with that. And then w what about, was there ever a time as an entrepreneur that you had a similar experience about, Hey, I feel like I'm being benched and I got to go back and work on my swing and rethink everything. Did you take that play, that playbook from what you did to be successful in MLB. And I know you're really successful right now and have a great venture called Greenfly, but was there a moment, and I, I know you haven't had all successes like me, was there a moment where you felt benched and you know kicked out of the, of the, of the, of the batting cage? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's, you know, I was involved in some startups that didn't work and it, and it's, you know, it, it's frustrating because you know, especially as the guy who has, you know, the bigger, bank account, you know, it's, yeah, right. you know it, it gets stressful because you have to burn every month and you're like, what do you, you have to make decisions? What do I do? And, and finally you get to the point where it's like, I, I just can't keep. Well, you, you know? weren't Lenny Dykstra, right? Like you let, let his ego get so far in the way, he just kept throwing his exactly. money at a deal. And I did the same thing as, you know, a wealthy entrepreneur. I felt so bad and responsible for everyone that in the end I ended up hurting everyone because not only did I let them all down, I, I let my whole family down and I wasn't able to help anyone anymore. Right. And it's terrifying. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's tough because I think, as you said, the ego plays a part of it, as, as you mentioned, Lenny Dykstra. So, I mean, you have to really um, set boundaries and, and, you know, you kind of, you live and learn on those things as I'm sure you did. Yeah, and so tell me how you use meditation and breathing and Jigong, you know, that philosophy and business kind of getting out of your own way because your ego has a need to be right, has a need to be offended, a need to be superior, inferior and separate. And, and those are the areas that hurt you in sports, but even more, I think in business, especially when we're dealing with raising money, making money, you know, holding, you, you did some family and friends uh, rounds. I know that as well, which is, you know, talk about pressure. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I will tell you, you know, I have watched, you know, my athletes that we represented run out in front of hundreds of thousands and even millions of people on TV. But, when you've taken aunts and uncles and neighbors and friends and, and you, na you know, neighborhood friends money and have to tell them, Hey, you know, remember how great that venture was. And I'll tell you, for me, I took friends money that they begged me because I was one of these Midas guys. Everything I touched was winning. Yeah. And so they're like, please, I want to get in this involved with this. I'm like, look, it's really risky. You know, it's not what you think. And yeah, but you're just saying that cause you're making all right. And then when it all goes down, nobody remembers you saying, I don't <laughs> Of course, of course. <laughs> so, you know, what's the pressure comparison? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, you, you never want to fail and you never want to fail, you know, when other people are, are relying on you. And in, in, in sports, you have, you have the fans and it's, it's, you know, if you're in the, with the Mets, we, we, you know, blew a, seven game lead with 17 to play and you know people like take they take it really seriously so anytime anyone's depending on you and you're failing them it's 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 tough whether it's business or whether yeah. it's sports but you know as far as the meditation side of it I, I think um you know i always just try to live by doing the right thing and trying to be right by people and and it's very much similar to staying in the moment and it's like look um i'm always going to be up front with people and tell them you know exactly what the situation is and you know, and, and leave it to them to make the decision of what they want to do. Would you rather publicly disappoint, meaning, you know, losing streak, oh, and 10, right? All that stuff is public, or is it tougher to privately disappoint, meaning you took your Aunt JoJo's money and <laughs> right. lost it, or, right. you know, other business associates? 
Which, which one's truly more difficult for you, or, the, or they're just different? I mean, I would imagine the the losing of the ants money and is yeah. is probably worse. I mean, I think, um, you know, as I said, any any time you disappoint, it's it sucks. Yeah. And you you know, on the flip side, if 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 you make your ant a bunch of money, then it's probably even better feeling than um, than you know winning a, a World Series. If you're making people that that you know could right. get a good bump and enjoy it, then, that's my favorite part. Right? Yeah, it's exactly. so nice. Like people buy a house because of you yeah. or retire because of you. And I have been blessed in my career that I haven't just lost people money. I've been yeah. blessed where like people still will get teary eyed and say, you know, we really changed want you my to life. come over. Yeah. yeah, you changed my life. And, and they're married with kids and all this stuff. Now, um, take and tell me, because this is the playbook, what's the number one lesson that you've learned off the field that maybe you didn't carry over from the field, but in this business world now is hyper-competitive, very focused, intelligent person. What's the number one piece of advice or lesson that you've learned now as an entrepreneur and a successful one? I mean, I, I think baseball is, of all the sports is probably the most analogous in that um, you go through a lot of slumps. And you know, when you're starting something or you know, any, any business is going to go through ups and downs. And, um, as a baseball player, you, you feel like you're never going to get hit again. You literally can say there's days where you say, I could just grab someone out of the stands and they have a better chance of getting hit than I do. Right. Which and may be true the way energy works. It's the way it's right. maybe true. And, and on the flip side, then when you get, you know, I, I was very streaky. And then when I get hot, I was the hottest guy on the planet and couldn't get out. And it's the same, it's exactly the same in an early stage company. You get this momentum, you get this energy, and you just you just kind of learn it's like i guess it's like surfing you just you know the set of waves is going to come in and you just got to be prepared to when the waves come in to be able to ride them and and not not miss them and that's i, th I think that's probably the biggest and i think that another lesson that you take you pull out of sports especially when you're running a business is how important um, your team is and you know i was always the type that I, even as a player, I didn't want to be the guy on the team. I always liked to be the wingman. So in Toronto, I, I, I loved being Carl Stogato's wingman. Nice. Um, in LA, at first I was Gary Sheffield's wingman, and then they traded him because he was tired of LA and wanted to move on. And and then all of a sudden it was just me. And you know, first year was it was tough. I ended up having a, you had a to great be Maverick year. instead of Goose. You have to be Maverick <laughs> instead of Goose, and that's tough. And yeah. I ended up I, I had this really tough early part of the year and then I went I got the super super hot and hit four home runs in the game and nine in like five games and all of a sudden it turned my season around but you know the next couple of years I struggled a little bit and um it just it, it wasn't my personality and it's the same in business I like to be the wingman I, I have a great CEO running Greenfly and um he and co-founder and and he is the guy that I rely on I like to he bounces stuff off of me and and you know we're both you know, working more than full time, but I like to be that role. So, and then we have to have a the team that we do and rely on them to whether the developers or sales or marketing and really um, try to rely on them to, to do their job well and help, you know, give them the tools they need to be successful. So all these lessons, getting out of your own way, this new awareness through meditation and breathing, and then finally, you know, teamwork, you know, th those lessons apply both on and off the field. It's interesting because I was worried when I left Lee Steinberg with Warren Moon that, you know, he's the quarterback, but I'm the CEO. Mm -hmm. And would he be a good wingman for me? And it's really interesting because I think we both have evolved that there is a lot of pressure when Warren Moon is your wingman, right. not, not your, you know, Maverick. Yeah. And I, I like to be Goose, right? That's a sports agent's <laughs> right. job. Right. right. I love to say that, oh, my God, I assisted in Sean Green and Eric Karras and all of these great athletes' career and Warren Moon and Steve Young and Troy Aikman being their wingman. Like you said, those guys helped you. Yeah. You know, Jeff Morad was a big help in your career. Of course. But to have not only to now be Maverick and have Warren Moon – be my wingman yeah. and then see if he could accept because over the last three years I built this brand, right? The, you know, top 10 podcast that we have a TV show, all these great things that have gone on. I was scared that God Warren might feel competitive with me or feel like he had to be the quarterback and you know, I had to be the coach or whatever, but it hasn't, he's really truly a, an unbelievable wingman and I've had to really own it. And I think sometimes, you know, whether it was on the field or off, you still have that energy that, I'd rather not quite own it, right? And you know, be that cleanup guy. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of athletes make the mistake um, of 
feeling having such a big ego that they feel like they need they were the guy maybe in, in their sports career and they feel like they need to be the guy in something they they don't, don't really know much about and they feel like it'll just translate because they've they've been able to beat the odds to make it you know in sports um but i i think others like warren sounds like a lot of guys they they get they get so much humbler and nicer as they as they move away from the game and i think you realize you know that life is you know you're not you're not catered to like you were as a player and you don't need to have that edge to to try to be successful on the field and it's almost like to a to a man guys that i used used to play with and against are much different people when they retire. Um, and I think the ones like, you know, they will like to step in. A lot of them probably would like to step into that wingman role in business if they're smart enough to know that um, and, and humble enough to know that there's people like you that are, are much more successful in that arena. Or have the situational knowledge. Well, I was dreaming about playing 15 years right. in the league, I was working on my situation yeah. knowledge and paying a lot of dummy tax and those things. It's interesting because I believe you can change your, your life with two simple words and, and those are thank you. And you've always been just like such a gracious person from the day that I met you and I've watched you. Um, but there's also two other words I think that really hit home when athletes take their playbook off the field. And those two words sit on my nightstand today. I don't have to put thank you there anymore. I don't need that reminder because right. I believe it's the most powerful world, words in the world. But it's radical humility uh, because we do share, you know, a hyper competitive world with great successes. And it's really easy not to get out of your own way and to believe your own BS. Yeah. And I just, you know, want all of our listeners on the playbook. I know you gave some great lessons, but to really know that you live by those what I'll call the double double from one of the guys who hits a lot of doubles. Uh, <laughs> thank you and radical humility. You come in to an office or to a business meeting, all the places that I witness, and they would never know, you know, not only on the field how great you are, or even who you were, if, if they weren't a Dodger or, or a fan. You could walk in and they, they would just say, What a kind, smart person. And to me, that's a great compliment. And to that matter, the last question is, What legacy do you want to leave, Sean? through everything that you're doing? I mean, that's a tough question. You know, what legacy? I, I think probably that I I did things the right way. And that's that's kind Very of along cool. lines of what you're saying. I mean, in baseball, you know, I, I stayed away from the steroids. I stayed away from, you know. You got those skinny arms. You can prove skinny it. Skinny arms. Yeah, you can see <laughs> my skinny neck. Right. Um, so I, I, I feel like I, I went about it. I I was good to the fans. I was, I tried to be, you know, I, I, I never. community. Yeah, the community, charitable, and I, I tried to, I never forgot what I felt like as a kid going to a game, and I tried to connect with kids um, who were coming that looked up to me or wearing my jersey or whatever it was. And, you know, I tried to keep those same principles now in business, and hopefully, you know, Greenfly and any other ventures that I'm involved in, you know, reach great success, and, and it goes well, and and um everyone's happy and makes money and jojo as you said is, right. <laughs> is happy but you know that that's the goal but it's i i know going into that that's not going to change my my life or who i am it's just it's just a an outcome right and and it's i think it's important just to stay centered and realize that you know none of this stuff matters i mean at the end of the day we need Amen. to we need to eat you know we need Be our happy. relationships and sleep and yeah, you know, all that rest is, is pretty much bs yeah so um it's still a fun game and i want to play it i enjoy it i want to make money i want to you know help people i want to do all those things but um you know I, I i try to maintain the perspective of you know what's important that's awesome well you definitely could be our wingman anytime with green fly or anything else that you do i do still have my sean green sign helmet right next to my sandy cool nice. picture and ball so that's my jewish hall of fame in my my home uh, but, you know, I think you fit into our model of making a lot of money, helping a lot of people and having a lot of fun. And I am just so grateful, not only that you're on the podcast, but more importantly, I consider you a friend and a great business partner of Warren and mine. So thanks, Sean. Yeah, thank you. I Take appreciate it. it. Right on. Thank you. Uh, you don't need the mic. You don't need the pat on the back and you don't need the spotlight. You give it to others and they know that they got it from you. Then you scored.